At 10.24 p.m., this is from the National Review, Merritt McArdle has said, Ford's ex-boyfriend contradicts her on polygraph. So let's find out what is going down. And we get to the letter, we get to what it all means, very powerful stuff, massively going to affect the midterms, you name it. Here's the article. The ex-boyfriend of one of the women accusing Brett Kavanaugh of sexual misconduct has suggested to the Senate Judiciary Committee that she may have perjured herself on several issues during her testimony. When an entire case relies upon your honesty, dishonesty in one thing is, to me at least, dishonesty in everything. So, Thursday. Can you believe it was just Thursday? Christine Blasey Ford testified Thursday to Congress about her allegation that the Supreme Court nominee sexually assaulted her at a party in the early 1980s when they were both minors in high school. Kavanaugh trapped her in a room, pinned her to a bed, and covered her mouth while trying to remove her clothing. Ford said an incident that has caused her lasting trauma. Now, here's the part that matters. Let's zoom in just a smidge on this. During her testimony, Ford stated under oath that she has never coached anyone on taking a lie detector test. Never, she answered when asked whether she had offered advice to any individual planning to submit to a polygraph examination. On Monday, the Senate Judiciary Committee said they had received a sworn statement from a man claiming to be Ford's former boyfriend, whose name is redacted from his letter, saying he personally witnessed Ford coaching a friend for a polygraph test. Wild stuff. So, I don't know if you can see this. It's a little blurry. I'm going to read it out for you just in case you can't. So, this man says, I, redacted, am a current resident of redacted California. I first met... Christine Blasey, now Dr. Christine Blasey Ford, in 1989 or 1990 in California. From 1990 to 1991, I was just friends with Ford. From approximately 1992 to 1998, I was in a relationship with Dr. Ford. I found her truthful and maintained no animus towards her. During our time dating, Dr. Ford never brought up anything regarding her experience as a victim of sexual assault, harassment, or misconduct. Dr. Ford never mentioned Brett Kavanaugh. During some of the time we were dating, Dr. Ford lived with Monica L. McLean, who I understood to be her lifelong best friend. During that time, it was my understanding that McLean was interviewing for jobs with the FBI and the U.S. Attorney's Office. I witnessed Dr. Ford help McLean prepare for a potential polygraph exam. Dr. Ford explained in detail what to expect, how polygraphs worked, and helped McLean become familiar and less nervous about the exam. Dr. Ford was able to help because of her background in psychology. He goes on to say, Dr. Ford and I lived together while we were dating and stayed together in a long-distance relationship when Dr. Ford moved to Hawaii sometime around 1998, although I'm not sure of the particular year, and it might have been a bit earlier or later. While visiting Ford in Hawaii, we traveled around the Hawaiian islands, including one time on a propeller plane. Dr. Ford never indicated a fear of flying. To the best of my recollection, Dr. Ford never expressed a fear of closed quarters, tight spaces, or places with only one exit. I assisted Dr. Ford with finding a place to live in redacted California, she ended up living in a very small 500-square-foot house with one door. Despite trying to maintain a long-distance relationship, I ended the relationship once I discovered that Dr. Ford was unfaithful while living in Hawaii. After the breakup, I took her off the credit card we shared, but nearly one year later, I noticed Dr. Ford had been charging the card and charged about $600 worth of merchandise. When confronted, Dr. Ford said she did not use the card, but later admitted to the use after I threatened to involve fraud prevention. I didn't speak again to Ford until about 2002, when Ford contacted me briefly. After that, I hadn't thought much about her until I saw her story in the Washington Post on Sunday, September 16th, 2018. I do not want to become involved in this process or current investigation, but wanted to be truthful about what I know. Signed, redacted. 10 to 2018 801 PDT. And this statement has been made under oath. 
So let's go over the letter just a little bit more in detail. Now, as fair as humanly possible. Want to be fair, want to be objective. So the fact that Dr. Ford never brought up anything about being a victim of sexual assault, harassment, or misconduct. Dr. Ford never mentioned Brett Kavanaugh. Okay. It doesn't help her case, but it doesn't torpedo her case either because it was something she didn't want to talk about. She was ashamed. She was blocking it. Whatever, right? Repressed. Who knows, right? Okay, so it doesn't help her case, but it also doesn't torpedo it either. But anyway, during some of the time we were dating, Dr. Ford lived with Monica L. McLean, who I understood to be a lifelong best friend. It was my understanding McLean interviewing for jobs with the FBI U.S. Attorney's Office. <sighs> now, my understanding, my understanding, Stefan Molyneux's understanding is when you go for a polygraph exam, pretty much the first question you're asked is, have you been coached on how to take a polygraph exam? Have you been helped in taking this polygraph exam? Particularly if it's somebody who's an expert in these things. And if you have, then the polygraph is not valid, not given. Maybe you don't even get a chance to work for these places. So Monica L. McLean. Mike Cernovich did a lookup, and yes, there was uh, uh, Monica L. McLean who works in this, uh, in this field. So that's kind of important. So is that cheating the polygraph exam? Is that giving unjust aid towards passing a polygraph exam? I don't know. But here's the thing. If you are in law enforcement and you know that someone has perjured herself, then you have to come forward. You have to say something. It's not just like some guy on the street, oh, he told the lie, I don't have to do anything about it. You have to come forward. You have a positive obligation to come forward as far as I understand it. But why has this Monica McLean not come forward? Well, if, as this seems to indicate, Dr. Ford helped her to take the polygraph, and if Monica McLean was asked if anyone had helped her take the polygraph, then Monica McLean might not have come forward because she doesn't want to reveal that she knows Dr. Ford has helped somebody with a polygraph because helped her, Monica McLean, with a polygraph, which Monica McLean probably didn't talk about much when she was taking the polygraph. So that seems quite important to me. Dr. Ford, the man, says, Dr. Ford and I lived together, dating, stayed together, long distance relationship, moved to Hawaii. Well, you know, fear of flying, blah, blah, blah. So this next part is important. Visiting Ford in Hawaii, they traveled around the Hawaiian Islands one time in a propeller plane. Now, I've taken some propeller planes. They're small. They're loud. Like, if you have a fear of flying, other than being strapped to the gonads of Superman while he flies through a hurricane, you probably, the last place you want to be is on a propeller plane. It's really small. It's really tight. It's really loud. It's bumpy. It's bouncy. Every little pocket of air, you're up and down all over the place. So if you're in a propeller plane flying around, Dr. Ford never indicated a fear of flying. Why is that important? Because she said she couldn't come to testify because she's too scared to fly. Too scared to fly. So he goes on to say, to the best of my recollection, Dr. Ford never expressed a fear of closed quarters, tight spaces, or places with only one exit. He helped to find a place, a small 500 square foot house with one door. Because remember, she said, well, I need two doors. And that's why I began with having fights with my husband about a big renovation. I need two doors because I don't want to be tight. I need a, two exits. I mean, that's why Kavanaugh came up. Or that's why this assault came up. It's all about trauma and, and I, claustrophobia and needing exits. But if she's living in a tiny, a 500 square foot, that's tiny with one door. How is that possible? If you have claustrophobia, that's probably not where you're going to be. He goes on to say, despite trying to maintain a long-distance relationship, I ended the relationship. Dr. Ford was unfaithful while living in Hawaii. Now, remember, this is under oath. So this isn't just, I think, well, of course, Dr. Ford was under oath. I get all that, too. Anyway, so then, it, you know, he says that she ripped him off for 600 bucks by continuing to use his credit card for a year after they... <laughs> oh, my God, you can't make this stuff up. I know it's an overused phrase, but you just can't. 
And then she said she didn't use the card and then it later admitted it after she thre- he threatened to involve fraud prevention. So yeah, she, she lied. She cheated, she lied, she stole according to this guy. So it's a huge deal. This is massive. I mean, this is massive. So, whew. yeah, so they dated for six years and these are all of his statements. So upon receiving these statements, committee chairman Chuck Grassley wrote a letter to Ford's lawyers requesting the results of the polygraph Ford took, as well as other evidence he said has been withheld from the committee. The former boyfriend's statement this is according to Grass, uh, Grassley, raises, quote, raises specific concerns about the reliability of her polygraph examination results. Dr. Ford cited the results of this polygraph examination to support her allegations, he said. It's unfair to rely on the results of a polygraph examination while withholding the materials necessary to assess the accuracy of the results. So, she was specifically asked about this. Specifically asked about all of this. In the uh, examination that occurred, the prosecutor, Rachel Mitchell, said, or asked Blasey Ford, have you ever had discussions with anyone on how to take a polygraph? Never, said Blasey Ford. Question. I don't just mean countermeasures, any sort of tips or anything like that. Answer. No. Question, have you ever given advice to someone who was looking to take a polygraph? Answer, never. Well, never, I was scared. So you could say, well, she didn't coach her on how to beat it or anything like that, but the question is very clear. Have you ever given advice to someone who was looking to take a polygraph? The answer, never, very confidently. That is astonishing. So this Monica McLean, there was a Monica McLean at the SDNY office in 2008. And if this is the same person, then Ford's ex-boyfriend is claiming that Blasey Ford coached her on what polygraphs are, how they work. I don't know if she coached her on how to pass or who knows, right? But that contradicts sworn testimony. It's sworn testimony. Have you ever given advice to someone who was looking to take a polygraph? How polygraphs work, what you can expect, this is all advice. Now, if McLean is still an agent, right, then she has to come forward with evidence that Ford perjured, perjured herself. Now, you have to disclose this stuff. You are under positive obligation. Now, why wouldn't you come forward? Well, if you got coaching on passing the polygraph and you didn't talk about it, then isn't that fraud? Again, I'm no expert on these things. This is just kind of puzzling this through stuff through logically. Now, here's the question. Is this true? Well, the answer is we don't know. We don't know if it's true or not. But it's kind of testable. It's kind of testable, right? So you can look at uh, you can look at airline travel tickets. You can look at passport stuff. You can look at a wide variety of things. See if this guy dated her and this that kind of stuff, right? You can try and find this uh, this uh, woman, Monica McLean. You can ask her about what happened. You can you know put her under oath. You can find out this kind of stuff. I got to tell you why. I'm leaning towards thinking this is probably true because this guy is naming someone who was trying to get into the FBI. And so that's kind of testable. And if you're naming someone who got some kind of advice or coaching on a polygraph who's now in the FBI, if you're wrong, you're kind of accusing someone of something pretty bad, right? I mean, potentially. So why would he be doing that if he didn't believe that it was true, if he didn't accept that it was true? There's a risk to all of this kind of stuff that doesn't really exist as much on the Blasey Ford side. So this is, I mean, this story is like, it's mind-blowing. It's mind-blowing. 
everything that's happening here. So people are going to start digging into this. They're going to try and figure out who this guy is. Lord above help you, my friend, if the media find out who you are. They're going to just tear into you like a bunch of piranhas on a wounded cow in the Amazon. But, uh, you know, stay low, man, stay low. If Because uh, if he's out there naming FBI agents and saying that they were they got advice on polygraphs and so on, that's pretty dicey. That's a pretty dicey thing to do unless you're pretty certain. So, yeah, this is, uh, this is pretty wild because it certainly seems to indicate that there's no fear of flying. It has, does indicate a past pattern of deceptive behavior if uh, he's right about her cheating on him and lying to him and stealing uh, from him through his credit card and lying about that as well. I mean, that's kind of a pattern of behavior. And if she is willing to help someone with a polygraph, to give advice on a polygraph when that person is not supposed to get advice on polygraphs, that seems kind of significant. That seems like uh, not, if it's true, it's not the very highest attainment of potential professional standards that I can possibly imagine. Let's just, <laughs> let's just put it that way. So if this stuff pans out, if, if it turns out that there's facts here, I mean, for heaven's sakes, I mean, this is a woman who a couple of weeks span says, oh, it's the early 80s. Oh, it's the mid 80s. Well, the early 80s could be 1980 to 1981. The mid 80s could be up to 1987. We're talking like six or seven years span and gap of not knowing when things are. That seems important. The fact that she's not turned over one of the key pieces of evidence, which is a therapist notes, the fact that she hasn't turned those over, despite the fact that the therapist notes, well, probably because of the fact that the therapist notes contradict what she has said, is terrible, absolutely terrible. If this stuff pans out, if I had to put money on it, I think it probably will. But if this stuff pans out to a large degree, the story is done. Now, if this story is done, y'all got to look at the mirror. Oh, everyone is out there chanting, you believe the victim, believe the victim. Y'all got to look in a mirror and figure out why you're susceptible to this kind of stuff so regularly. Because if this stuff pans out, you're wrong. And you're catastrophically wrong. You're like, destroy someone's life wrong. You're like, destroy someone's career. You know, dozens of people at Harvard Law filed Title IX to make sure that this guy couldn't come back in and teach, which he loves to do. His children, his 10-year-old daughter, praying for Blasey Ford. Have to explain all of this to your children. If you're wrong, you are horribly, viciously, family, career, and life-destroying wrong. And if we are going to continue to have any 